All right, guys, I don't know if you're still in Psalm 118. Um, we're not going to be looking at the whole chapter. I just wanted to take one verse out of that psalm. So if you look at Psalm 118, verse 8, Psalm 118, verse 8, it says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Okay? It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. The title of the sermon tonight is called Confidence in Man. Confidence in Man. Now, I've preached... This sermon, what are we now, 2018? I've preached this sermon three years ago in the church in Punchbowl. Um, I caught it standards and samples then. I don't think any of you guys were attending while when I preached this sermon. It was one of my very first sermons that I preached in the church in, in uh, Punchbowl. But I've decided to call it Confidence in Man this time, and I've made some little changes here. But the key thing that I want to preach on today, obviously, is who ought we ought to trust in. In man or in God? All right, in God. Now, here's the problem. This is the problem that I see with new believers, okay, bathed in Christ, is they often put confidence in man. It happens all the time. Even if they say to me, no, I'm only trusting Jesus. I mean, for salvation, they're only trusting Jesus. But when it comes to just their daily walk and learning the scriptures, I'm telling you, more often than not, they're trusting in man. Okay? They're putting their trust in their favorite preacher. They're putting their trust in their pastor. Now, there's nothing wrong with that in of itself. There's nothing wrong with having godly examples in our life that we look up to and that we learn from. Okay? But the important thing about the Christian life is that we have a balance. Okay? Because if we put all our trust in a man, we know they're made of the same flesh and blood that we are. We know that we struggle with sins. We know we struggle with difficulties. We know that we fail. Then, of course, the men of God that you look up to, guess what? They're going to fail sometimes in life. Okay? Now, they should be more mature. They should be more developed in their Christian walk. They ought to be reflecting Christ more than others. But at the same time, they've still got that same sinful flesh. They still have that, that sinful nature. And I promise you this. It doesn't matter which man you look up to, what preacher, what pastor, what church you look up to. There's always going to be problems. You know, I don't know if anyone looks up to me. But at some point, you're going to find my faults. You're going to find the things that I struggle with. You're going to see things. You, I might say things to offend you. I might say things to upset you. And then you're going to have to decide, wow, I, I was offended by Kevin that day. Maybe I don't even know about it, but you know, I was offended. You're going to have to decide, well, am I going to go to church next week? Am I going to show up to the next service? Or am I going to let this bother me and look elsewhere? And this is what the, the, the problem that I find with a lot of new believers is they look to man, you know, let's say a pastor, for example, a bishop. That pastor fails them. And then instead of going, oh, I've got to learn my lesson not to trust in man, instead of that, they look for another man that they can trust in. And they go from man to man to man to man. And I often associate this with people that are church hoppers. I don't know if you're familiar with that term. People that go to this one church, they're there for a while. Everything's all right. Then something happens, they get offended. Oh, I can't go to that church anymore. I go to another church. It's all going well for a while. They get offended. I can't go to that church anymore. I go to that church. They're not established. They're not balanced. They don't have their trust and reliance on the Lord Jesus Christ. They have it on man. They have it on a specific church. And I just want us to make sure that we're balanced as Christians, okay? That we're balanced, that we understand, yes, there's a place for good godly men. There's a place for good preachers in our life. But we must always have our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. Because He's not going to fail us. He's perfect. He's without error. You know, He's without sin. He's always the same. Today, yesterday, and forever. So our eyes ought to be fixed on Jesus. And let me say to you this. If you just have your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, you know that you're going to rely and draw your strength from Him, then when men fail, it's not going to discourage you. When men fail, you're not going to leave a church over some small issue. Okay? So this is the important thing. Now, I call this standards and samples when I preach this in the church in Punchbowl. Let me explain to you very quickly why that is, because I think it's, it's very important. And while I'm explaining this, you guys can turn to Philippians chapter 3. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. We won't get to that passage just yet, but just so that you're ready. Philippians chapter 3. There are two things that are often mistaken okay, in our lives. We have things that are standards, and we, think, we have things that are samples. Okay? Now think about this, this word standard. What is a standard? Now the etymology of that word standard comes from an old Frankish term. It's an old military term meaning stand hard. If I said to you, stand hard, what am I saying? Don't be movable. You know, stand firm in where you are. Okay? That's where the word standard comes from. It's something that ought to be unmovable. Okay? 
It's a military term. But in a modern use of that word standard, it's often at a level of quality and a level of attainment. Oh, you've reached this standard. Okay, we might, you know, we talk about the qualifications of a bishop, for example. We might call that the standards of a bishop as well. You know, this is something to attain to. This is something that a bishop ought to have in his life or someone that's striving to be a pastor, striving to be a bishop. This is the standard that they ought to meet. Okay? So standards are important in our lives. It's something that is supposed to be uh, unmovable, something that's fixed, something that you can be assured about. Okay? That, that's what a standard is. And then when we talk about a sample, what's a sample? A sample is a small portion of that standard. Okay? A sample is a small portion of a larger whole. So you might think about when you go to you know, Woolworths, you go know, grocery shopping, or sometimes people have a, have a sample of a product, right? Sometimes you might try something, you might you know, try it. You go to a restaurant, you walk past a restaurant, they're giving out samples, okay? Now obviously that sample does not represent what's in their menu. It's just a small part of a larger whole, okay? You don't go in there and, get it and, and choose from a menu something you're gonna eat and they're gonna give you this small little sample, no. The sample is there for a purpose so you can try it and say, hey, that's t that tastes good. I want to see what the standard is. I want to see you know, what, what that full meal is like and, and get you as, as a marketing thing, right? To get you in to purchase that product. So a sample is a small portion of a larger part. A sample is taken for analysis, for review, or for testing. Now when you think about the Christian life, what ought to be the standard? When we understand these concepts, what ought to be the standard? Which person is the standard in our lives? Which person is unmovable? Which person are we to look to knowing that they're not going to change and they're always reliable? Who's going to stand hard for us when we're down and we need His help? It's Jesus Christ, isn't it? It's Jesus Christ. But then Jesus Christ has also given us samples. Okay? Men that we can look up to, men that we can learn preaching from, like, uh, doctrine from, that we can grow in the Lord for, these people are samples. Or as we would use it, examples. Okay? Examples and they ought to be a representation of the standard. That standard being Jesus Christ. But when the, when the, when the, when the sample fails, the standard remains true. Okay? It doesn't change. And this is what happens to new believers. They come into church, like I said, they get offended by some man, they, they get offended by the preacher, by the pastor, and it's like, oh, forget it, I don't want to be in church. Oh, forget it, I don't want, you know, this Christianity stuff, it's not worth it. Why? Because their eyes are on the sample, and their eyes need to be on the standard. That standard being the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, let's talk about food for a moment. You know, have you heard of the, the Heart Foundation, and the ticks of approval for the Heart Foundation on certain foods? Well... If you buy that, that product, if they've got that heart foundation's heart and tick of approval, then supposedly you're supposed to know that product is good for your health. Okay? So that, that product meets a certain standard. Okay? That's what a standard is. That product meets that standard. But then other products that don't have that tick of approval does not meet the standard of the heart approval. Or maybe it does meet it, but it just doesn't, doesn't want that approval for whatever reason. And one of my jobs that I had um, in, a, in a previous firm that I worked for, it was quite a large business, it was quite international as well. I worked as a quality auditor. I don't know if you guys know what an auditor is. An auditor tends to go into a business and work out whether the things they're doing, the practices they're doing, the processes they're doing, meet up to a certain standard. Okay? A lot of, a lot of companies strive to meet certain standards so that, especially if they're a large, uh, a, a large company, and especially if they're selling to, say, government departments, that the, the purchaser, the consumer knows, oh, this is a legitimate business, this is a legitimate company, and when I go and purchase their products, their goods or their services, I know it meets a certain standard. And so my job as, a, as an auditor, as a quality auditor, was to go in, I, I, had a, I had a set of standards that I had to make sure the business was meeting. And if the business was not meeting those standards, then I would need to raise that as an issue to the management team and say, hey, the standard says this, but you're doing this. And if, you know, if we get auditors from outside, you're going to be marked as failing in this area. So we need to fix this up before we get those external auditors to come. You understand? So my job as an auditor, I didn't know everybody's job. I didn't know what everybody did. But I knew what, you know, I'd just sit down with someone. I'd get a, a sample of the work they were doing. They would tell me, oh, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this. 
I would then take out the work instructions or the processes, the documentation they would have of that job, and I would compare, okay, this is what your, your, your standard says, this is what your, your process says, and this is what you're doing. Does it line up? Does it match? And if it matches, cool, you meet the standard. But if it's not matching up, there's a problem. Either you're doing it wrong, or that documentation needs to be updated to reflect what you're doing now, okay? So, we need to understand that we need to take samples in order to understand what the standard is. Whether that sample is failing, or whether that sample meets what that standard is, okay? And again, just reinforcing the fact that men, godly men, pastors, preachers, are an example or a, a sample of the standard which is God, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look, let's look at Philippians 3.13. Philippians 3.13. The Bible reads, Brethren, so this is Paul speaking to the Philippian church. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Now notice the next, verse, uh, next words in chapter, uh, verse 14. I press toward the mark. Now this is Paul's way of saying, I press toward the standard. Okay, he's pressing toward this mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus and Christ Jesus. So we see Paul's vision, Paul's eyes were on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's saying, hey, I'm pressing toward that mark. I want to be more like Jesus Christ in my life. You see that, right? Look at verse 15. Let us therefore be, uh, let us therefore as many as be perfect, be thus minded. For if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. And look at verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of who? Of Jesus? No, he says of me, of Paul. And mark them which walk, which walk as ye have at us for an and sample. You know those words? He says, hey, Philippian church, you've got me and others that walk like me as your in sample. And he says, but we're trying to go for that high calling of Jesus Christ. We're pressing toward that mark. And one thing that you're going to find as you read through your Bible is especially when it comes to the epistles of Paul, you're going to see him many times saying, hey, I'm here to be your example. Follow after my steps. Follow what I'm doing, okay? But at the same time, he says, as I seek after Christ, as I walk after Jesus Christ, okay? So it's not that we just take every man, every preacher, every pastor, and every church and think, wow, this is a great standard to us, a great sample to follow. You only can follow them if they have set Jesus Christ as their standard and they're seeking to follow after Jesus Christ as well. Because again, guys, your favorite preachers, me, we're going to fail. At some point, we're going to make a mistake. We're going to do something wrong. Hopefully, it's nothing too serious. But I hope in your minds you think, wow, you know, that just proves that we're all men. That just proves that none of us are perfect and that we're all striving to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. So the standard that we read in Philippians 3 was that mark, the, 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 the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And Paul and other men were the end samples. Now I'm not sure if all your Bibles, if you, you go to King James, if they all say end samples. Some, sometimes they change it to examples. Okay, but again, um, these are different words. Okay, what does yours say, brother? End sample? End sample. End sample. Does everyone have end sample? Or... Have you got example? End sample. Ah, see, there you go. Your, your King James Bible actually has both. Okay? The end sample and the example. And a lot of people change it because they think the word end sample means example. And in many ways, it's, exact, it's almost exactly the same word. They think it's an archaic word for the word example. But there actually is a difference. Because the prefix for end sample is en, right? And then the prefix for example is ex, and they drop the s. Like, but they're both talking about samples. End sample, example. Okay. Now the difference is, is it's the prefix. So right now we've entered the building. We've got the prefix en. We've entered the building, but then we exit the building. It's ex, right? Uh, now 
It's not on the same level, but think of the word inhale. I know it's I and not Ian, but you've got inhale and you've got exhale. Okay? So in the same ways how those things are our opposite, in, in a way, so is and sample and example. And I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna go through all this today, but just very quickly to explain to you just a basic principle of this. When the Bible speaks of an ensample, it's an indirect um, something that you can learn from indirectly. And an example. Oh no, I've got it the other way around, sorry. And sample is something that you learn directly. And an example is something that you learn from indirectly. Okay, so for example, let me give you a very quick example of this. Let's say I, I tell my kids, hey, you know, you're not allowed, my little kids especially, because my other ones, you know, I say to my little kids, hey, don't touch the, the stove, because it's hot. Okay, now if someone else, one, one of the other kids comes and touches the stove and gets burnt, that's an example for them. Hey, wow, you know, that's dangerous. Right? It's an example. They're learning from that thing indirectly. But if they themselves went and touched it and got burnt and they learned that way, that's an end sample. It's something that they've learned directly. Okay? So uh, it's not a big deal in your Bibles. It's not like you have to worry that much about it. But there is a little uh, a pattern of difference between these two words. Okay? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. I just want to show you this example a few times here. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 says, Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. So again, now we have Paul talking to the Corinthian church. And again, he's saying, hey, be a follower of me. Why? Is it because Paul is the standard? No, I keep reading verse 17. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ." As I teach everywhere in the church. So, be ye followers of me. That's the sample of my ways there. That's the sample. But then, which be in Christ, that's the standard. Okay, so we always see this. Paul is always very careful to say, hey, follow me as long as I'm in Christ. As long as I am following the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, turn to chapter 11, please. Same book, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. This one's a little bit more, pop, more common, uh, more popular. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. It says, this is Paul again to the same church. Be ye followers of me, even as I am of Christ. Okay, be ye followers of me. Here's the sample, here's the example to the church. Even as I am of Christ. Christ is the standard. Now let me read to you quickly Hebrews 13. You don't need to turn there. Hebrews 13, 7 and 8. Hebrews 13, 7 says, Remember them which have the rule over you. So this is now Paul is talking about the, the pastor or the bishop of the church. He says, hey, remember them that have the rule over you. And let me just quickly say this to you. While we're in church, when we're gathered together, I do have the rule over you. But when it comes to outside of the church, when it comes to your workplace, when it comes to your house, your family, and everything else that you do outside of the church, I don't have the rule over you. Okay? And I, a lot of people make this mistake. They think the pastor has a rule over them in every aspect of their life. You know, pastor, what job should I get? You know, pastor, should I go on holidays? It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, the, 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 uh, the pastor, the bishop has rule over you in the church, in the congregation. Okay? Now that's just a side, side thought. It continues going. Who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. That's Hebrews 13, verse 7. So it says, hey, you know, those that have the rule over you, the bishop, the pastor, yeah, follow after them. Okay? But then verse 8 says this, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. So what is, you know, so you talk about considering the end of their conversation. What should be the end of the conversation? What should be the end of their walk? What should they be striving to achieve to be like Jesus Christ? That's why verse number 8 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So it's good to follow the faith of certain men, of faithful men, of godly men. But again, that's just an example. The standard which never changes is Jesus Christ, the same today, yesterday, or yesterday, today, and forever. Okay? I should um, turn to Acts 17, please. Acts 17. Because standards should never change. That's why it's a standard. 
Okay, it should never change. And that's why it's so important to have Jesus Christ as our standard. Because churches will change. You know, even pastors that once preached sound doctrine, that once preached things correctly, change. And they start preaching heresy. Or they start preaching things that they didn't believe before. Or they start teaching things that are not in their statement of faith of the church that are contradicting to the statement of, of, of faith in their church. That's not a good thing. But again, I've been, I've, been, I've been saved since I've been four. You know, I've been in church since I've been young. You know, I've got two, uh, two of my uncles in Chile are pastors themselves. So I'm pretty familiar with how churches go. And quite often, just churches change. You know, I grew up in a, in a uh, Baptist Union church in Capamata. Uh, Capamata Baptist Union, Baptist Union Church. And back then, it was great. They had the old-fashioned hymns. They were preaching from the King James Bible. I couldn't really fault anything that was being preached there. But slowly, they changed preaching the modern Bibles. Slowly, they changed all the music. It started to become a hill song. Slowly, they started to have dancing as, as the entertainment of the church and whatever. And I went, was it last year? They were celebrating a 100 years anniversary. You know, we went there and it was just, it was a joke to me. It was just, it was so watered down. There was nothing to learn. The entertainment, like I said, was dancing. And I was like, man, I can't believe this is, this is what's happened. And then at the, back of the, at, uh, at the back of the church, they had like the old pulpit that they used to be preached on. They had the old King James Bible that they had back then. I, I feel like, wow, now, now it's just a, like this museum display. You know, we, we were once like this, but now we're like this, you know, rock band or whatever, like, you know, look to, um, learning hill songs. Look, churches change. People change. It's not a good thing. But the, the thing that we can be sure about is that Jesus Christ does not change. Okay, what did I take to turn to? Acts 17, okay, thanks. Look at the Bereans here in Acts 17, verse 11. Acts 17, verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So the Bereans reviewed everything to the standard. Yes, Jesus Christ is the standard, but the word of God, the Bible, is the standard as well. In fact, they're both called the Word of God. Okay, Jesus Christ is the living Word of God. Your King James Bible as the written Word of God. Both essentially, you know, never changes. Okay, both are the standard. And we see that the Bereans, when they were here preaching, they would line up that preaching with the Word of God. Does it line up with what we see in the Scriptures or is it contradictive? They had the right mindsets. But again, young Christians, immature Christians, carnal Christians are going to get to a point where they say, well, this preacher seems okay. You know, Pastor Kevin seems all right. You know, he's, he's, he's sacrificing, coming down from the Sunshine Coast every week. I'm just going to believe what he says every time he preaches. Wrong. That's the worst thing you can do, okay? Because I am not the standard. You know, I'm trying to serve an example. I'm trying to seek after Christ and, and be that good example. But at the same time, whatever I preach needs to be compared to the Word of God. And any man you listen to, any of your favorite preachers, whether it's online or people you know in person, you must make sure that they line up with the Word of God. Okay? Understand the differences between the standard and the sample. The Word of God is definitely the standard. I'll just quickly read to you from Malachi 3.6. Malachi 3.6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. The Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord God, changes not. The standard never changes with the Word of God. You know, the world changes all the time. You know, the standards, standards in this world just get worse and worse. I don't know if you guys watch a lot of television. I don't recommend that you do. But often when you, when you watch TV or watch a movie, it says it gives us the ratings, right? It's, if it's G-rated, it's, it's supposed to be general for kids. If it's PG, it's, you know, parental guidance recommended. If it's M, I don't know, mature, 15 plus, I don't know. Uh, M, no, no, M is, I think it's for 15 and over, but you can watch it if you're younger. And then MA, I think you must be 15 and over. And then is it R? R rated for 18 plus or something like that? Look, when I was a kid, when things were G or PG, they really work. Okay, but now if you put on the TV and watch a PG rated movie or whatever, it's filled with wickedness. You know, it's filled with, with uh, you know, you know, women dressed immodestly. You know, it's filled with, with dirty jokes. 
It's filled with drug use. It's filled with, you know, fornication. It's filled with all these things, and it's PG. So well, why? It's still the same standards. It's still G, PG, yeah. But they've changed the standards. The world keeps changing. It continues going down this downward spiral. It gets worse and worse. I mean, marriage has changed in Australia. What was the standard of marriage before? One man and one woman. Now it's whatever. I don't even know what it is anymore. Have you tried, you know, we're, we're going to have our 10th kid. Every time we've had another kid, you know you've got to fill out the forms for Medicare and all that kind of stuff. It gets more and more complicated. Every, every, it's like, what, what now? What do they want? You know, it used to be mother and father, but now it's like mother and then mother or father or something else. It's like, and then it's like, the form just gets more and more complicated. It's like, I don't know anymore. What am I? Am I a father now? Or, uh, you know, the world has changed. But the word of God never changes. And, and, the, and the more this world changes, the more freaks like us, people that actually believe the Bible are going to stand out and look weird. Okay, because we're just trying to follow that standard. Right? This is what happens. The world just keeps changing. Um... Let me just keep going. Oh yeah, I had notes on marriage, I already covered that, okay? But, okay, I'll just say this very quickly. Obviously, our laws have changed in marriage. Obviously, now a man can marry a man, or a woman can marry a woman. One day, a man's going to be able to marry a robot, or, or their pet, or their house. It's, look, it, they've destroyed what marriage is, it's just going to be this downward spiral now. Just a continual downward spiral. Soon you'll be able to marry, you know, pedophilia is going to be legal, I'm sure. And soon marrying a little kid is going to be fine. Or, or marrying, you know, in your own family is going to be fine. You know, incest and all this kind of garbage. And in some ways, this, this agenda are winning in some ways, okay? And they've made changes to the law. Eventually the changes are going to happen in our dictionaries. Eventually there's going to be a generation of Australians that won't even know that marriage was once between man and woman. And that's what it was. But the thing that they're never going to be satisfied about, the thing they're never going to be happy about, is the fact that the Word of God has never changed in regard to this. The Word of God is always between, marriage will always be between one man and one woman. Okay? And they'll keep popping out these modern Bibles, and one day these modern Bibles are going to say, yep, it was Adam and Steve, if, if they haven't already. Right? But the true Word of God will never change. And God has promised that He's going to preserve His Word forever. So what might seem like victories today, I'm telling you now, what frustrates more, them more than anything is the fact that they cannot change the Word of God and they cannot destroy the Word of God. Okay, but what's important for us is that we stand true to what the Word of God says because we're not looking at the Word the Word as our standard. We're looking at the Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking at, at the Word of God as the standard. Please turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Just to reinforce this, Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, this is Jesus speaking, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. So if you want to be a wise man and build our house or our life upon a strong rock, a lot, uh, uh, um, uh, on a strong foundation, what are we to do? We're hearing the sayings of His and do them. Don't be a hearer only, but be a doer of the Word of God. Make sure that what you learn, you apply in your life, because that's what's going to give you the stability of the foundation that comes from the Word of God. Look at verse 25. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, that it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Now let me just say this, if you're trying to serve the Lord, you're trying to follow after God's ways, you have the word of God as your standard, as your foundation, it doesn't promise here that there won't be trials and difficulties in your life. Okay? Because it says there that the floods came, the winds blew, it beat upon the house. And in your life, you're going to go through beatings. You know, you're going to go through trials and difficulties and tribulation in your life. But if you founded your faith and your life on Jesus Christ and on His words and you're doing His words, then you're going to remain founded upon that rock. That house will stand strong. Look at verse 26. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not 
Don't think that this is about the unbelieving world. No, this is about believers. Believers that hear the word of God, but doeth them not. That can be on any of us. Okay? Shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Great was the fall of it. And let me say, I've seen pastors, good men of God, that I have personally looked up to, okay, in my past, and this is where I learned all this stuff, fail big time. I mean, great was the fall of it. You know, committing adultery or whatever and destroying their ministry. You know, no longer being qualified to lead a church, totally destroy all the ministry work that they had because they've done some foolish things, some foolish acts. They look like men that were, were serving the Lord. They look like they're on track. There's so many people looking up to them and then they fail and everyone gets depressed and saddened. And I, I've experienced that. I'll, I'll tell you about that later on. I've experienced that myself. But I want you to understand, yes, it's depressing when a good man of God fails, but have your eyes set on the standard being Jesus Christ and His Word. As, turn to 2 Peter, please. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Because the Bible doesn't just have good examples to follow. The Bible also has bad examples. So we can learn from those bad examples. Alright? So look at 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 4. It says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And look at this. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. So we see here that Sodom and Gomorrah was set as an, as an ensample to those that should live ungodly in the future. So not only do we have good examples to follow after, but the Bible also gives us bad examples to be careful of. Okay, and I think about immediately, I think about some of the, the godly men, the, the Old Testament saints that we read about. You know, we read about Abraham and, and Joseph and, uh, well, maybe not so much Joseph, he didn't do too many mistakes. But Abraham and, and Jacob and, you know, King David and, and uh, Samson. One reason I don't like Sunday school, one reason I don't like taking kids and teaching them watered down preaching I, I was in Sunday school for about four years, and I was a Sunday school superintendent. So I was looking after the Sunday school classes in a church. And, you know, I, I did the best I possibly could. But one thing that bothered me was the kind of doctrine that was being taught in Sunday school. Because they, they'd learn about these Old Testament saints, and they'd learn about how great they were, how they served the Lord, how they followed after the Lord. But these, this material would not teach them about their mistakes. The material wouldn't teach them about their failures. They wouldn't teach how they had committed murder, or had committed uh, adultery, or had, had left the Lord and, and followed after un ungodly idols and things like that. And I'm thinking, why are they leaving out this information? This is the good stuff, right? Yes, we can learn from the good examples, but we need to learn from the bad examples as well. Because we need to learn, hey, we ought not to make these same mistakes that these men of God made. And I remember as a child, because I obviously went to Sunday school in the church, I used to think, wow, these, these men, they're so good, they're so godly, they're, you know, they're doing the best they can, wow. And then when you start reading your Bible, it's like, hold on, who are these people? <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't learn about this. I didn't know, I didn't know King David, you know, took another man's wife and then ended up, ends up killing him. I didn't know, I didn't, who, no one told me this story. And then it, it kind of puzzles you, like, what in the world? But then when you, when you, when you leave out these bad examples, you, you, you diminish the purpose of why they're there. Okay, the purpose why they're there is so that we learn that it's not about being so much a great man, but that they serve a great God. That it's God that receives all the glory and praise that these men were able to accomplish anything in their lives in the first place. Even in their failures, and even they failed sometimes worse than all of us have failed. But still God was able to use these men to do great works. And that's the lesson, right? 
When you learn the bad example, you say, well, well, you know, men, we're, we're failures. But God, you're perfect and you can still use us. Great is your mercy. Great is your grace. Great is your love. Wow, we serve an amazing God. That's what these lessons are there for. So then uh, when you read the Bible, you go, wow, great God. But this watered down Sunday school material, you end up, wow, great men. No, you, you're, they're looking at the st- samples and not having their eyes on the standard. Okay. And then again, they grow up in church. They see that their pastor do something wrong. They get discouraged and they're out of church. Oh, you know, you know um, modern day Christianity can't, can't you know, compare to, to uh, you know, the saints of old. Not knowing that the saints of old made even worse mistakes, right? So it's about having the right mindset, having the right mind. Um, so I was talking about Solomon Gomorrah, and this is more about obviously the homosexuals, okay? Because we talk about Solomon Gomorrah, we talk about homosexuality, the sodomites, how wicked they were. You know, they themselves had changed the natural use of man and woman. You know, these are reprobate people. And Jesus Christ himself came down with the angels and destroyed these ungodly cities for their homosexuality. And what do we see here in Sydney? I'm glad I got out of Sydney, but you guys have to hear about the the gay and lesbian Mardi Gras. At least on the Sunshine Coast, I didn't even know it happened. (laughs) I didn't even know that was going on, but you guys have to put up with this stuff. And it just keeps getting worse. It's not just the, the gay and lesbian Mardi Gras. Now it's all over the media. It's all over the kids' programs. It's all over the, the, the schools. People are being taught this stuff. But look, there's an example or an example here that was brought to our attention how God hates this sin of homosexuality that he would destroy entire cities filled with these people. And we're headed down this road. We're headed down this road because preachers, because pastors, because churches are now too afraid to preach against this sin. Too afraid. So now, hey, it's open season for all manners of wickedness and ungodliness. Turn to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. Because I want to show you, it's not just the preacher. It's not just the bishop or the pastor. Or, or some godly man that is the example. Okay? Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. Uh, so Paul writes to the Thessalonian church, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Ghost. Now look at verse 7. So that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. So he's saying to the Thessalonian church, you're an example. It's not just the leadership, but the entire church is serving to be an example, a great example to the people in Macedonia and Achaia, to the other believers. And I would like this church, New Life Baptist Church in Sydney, to one day be seen as a godly example to other believers in this area. And they would see that we have a love for the Word of God. They would see that we have a love to worship and praise our God, that we have a love for the lost sinners, that they need to hear the gospel, okay? And that we would hopefully grow, if, if it's the Lord's will, that we would grow in, in time, and that we would serve as an example. You know, that we wouldn't just set, you know, the pastor, or just some godly man as the one that, you know, everyone ought to look at to. No, it's the entire church. All of us ought to mature and become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just for the bishop. A church can be a great example to other believers. A great blessing to other believers. Now let's go to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Because I want to leave you with one more example. So we have godly men as one example. Uh, We have, you know, uh, bad examples. That's another way to look at examples, right? So we can learn from the mistakes. Number three, you know, a church can be an example to other believers. But the last one I want to look at here is the most important one. John 13, 13. John 13, 13. This is Jesus speaking. Look at this. He says, Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. So we see in Jesus Christ, not only is he the standard, 
But he also came to set an example for us. Yes, we do look at the godly man. We can look at Paul and Peter and good men of God in the Bible and set them as our examples. But Jesus Christ himself did not just come to be the standard, not, to, not, not just to show us that he's the perfect lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, but he came to set us an example that we should walk after him. And there's a lot that we can learn from Jesus Christ. You know, don't, take, don't look at the Bible and say, well, Jesus was God. Of course he, he managed that situation well. Of course he was able to overcome temptation in the wilderness. Of course all these things. Of course at the age of 12, he was able to teach the law to the, to the doctors of the law during that time. Don't have that mindset. Remember, yes, he's God, obviously, but he was man at the same time. He was fully 100% man and he came and set us an example. That means at 12 years old, you can... How old are you, brother? Brother Michael? Ten. Ten. Two more years. Get, get a sermon ready. Two more years, you'll be preaching for us. Because Jesus Christ set this example for us. It can be done. Okay, don't think, oh, that was just Jesus. No. He came and set this example so we can follow after his steps. I'll just read to you 1 Peter 2, 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. That you should follow his steps. Okay? So Jesus Christ is definitely the ultimate example. Jesus Christ is both the, the standard and the sample. Both the standard and the sample. No, no man. There's no other man on this planet that can fulfill both those roles. The rest of us, we just serve it as an example, doing the best we can to reflect Jesus Christ in our lives. Now let me talk to you about the consequences of not rightly dividing between a standard and a sample. Okay, let me re talk to you about this very quickly. Again, just reinforcing the fact that God will never change. God will never fail. God will never fail you. Men will change. And men will fail you. And I'm, I'm just giving you the heads up right now. I'm going to fail you. Somehow. All right. I'm not necessarily saying I'm going to get into some major sin or anything like that. But there's going to be something. There's going to be something. I'm, like, I'm a bit sarcastic. And sometimes with my sarcasm, I say something that, you know, just to, be, you know, just to keep things light. But then I, I easily offend people sometimes by my sarcasm. I might say something like that and then you'll be like, does Kevin hate me? Why did you say that? Right? Look, you know, I have failures. You know, if, if you're true to yourself, you have failures also. And quite often when I see uh, people in churches fighting with one another, and you, try, you finally figure out, why are you guys fighting? It's this tiny little thing. This tiny little thing. Someone offended some of us. Just it's like, get over it, you know? It's just like a human being. They did wrong. Just forget it or, or ask for forgiveness or whatever it is. You know, seek to make things right. But don't get so discouraged that you hate going to church. Don't get so discouraged that you don't go to church. Don't get so discouraged that you throw out Christianity thinking, oh, there's no one that's, you know, that's uh, serving the Lord properly. You know, always fix your eyes on Jesus Christ because it doesn't change. Uh, another, another reason, another consequence of not rightly dividing between the san standard and the sample is you're going to have wrong expectations. Wrong expectations. Um, because as I said, Christians sometimes set men as standards. Oh, I've already kind of, oh, sorry, I covered this already. I, I, I merged these two things together. But my concern again was for new believers. New Christian believers, again, set in man as the stand, uh, as the, uh, standard instead of the sample. But uh, the, the third consequence of not rightly dividing between this is when the standard becomes the sample. When the standard, which is Jesus Christ, the Word of God, becomes the sample. Now, this is when the Bible just becomes another holy book. Now, I'm thinking of someone in particular right now I know of a young man that grew up in church, his father's a pastor, grew up knowing the Word of God, was able to tell us the Gospel, but right now wants nothing to do with church. He wants nothing to do with Christianity. In fact, it's almost like he hates his parents for bringing him up the way they brought him up. You know, I know of someone in particular right now, and when I last spoke to him, he said to me, you know how, you, you know, he says, you know how Christians take the Bible and you base everything in your life on the Bible? He goes, I don't think that's the way the Bible is meant to be written. I think it's just meant to be, you know, something you can take and read a little verse here, take something good out of that, and it's just like any other self-help book that's out there. So what did he do? You know, he got discouraged about church for whatever reasons, I don't know all the reasons, but now he sees the, the Bible, which is meant to be the standard, as a sample, 
as just some other book to get you through life. But there are many other books out there that can help you get through life. Okay? You, when you do that, you'll become spiritually malnourished. Okay? Because in Luke 4, 4, Jesus answered, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Every word of God. Now, if you've not read your Bible cover to cover, let me encourage you, you need every word of God to be nourished and to grow spiritually. Okay? If you've not read the Bible cover to cover, start now. Start tonight. You know, when you get home, and my recommendation is read the New Testament first. Start in Matthew, get to Revelation, because that's the easier books to get through. Then go to the Old Testament, start reading through the Old Testament. Especially if you're a younger believer, or you're someone that's been saved for a long time, but you've not really grown or matured much. Do that, okay? Because sometimes when you start with the Old Testament, you're not going to have the light of the New Testament helping you get through the Old Testament. When you have the light of the New Testament, the Old Testament becomes a lot clearer. But you need every word of God. You know, make it your plan, make it in your, a part of your life to get through the whole Bible at least once a year. It takes 15 minutes a day. Can you afford 15 minutes? 15 minutes a day. And you say, I don't have that time. Okay, what takes 15 minutes of your day in your life? You know, making yourself a coffee, that's five minutes, maybe. You know, drinking that coffee another five minutes. There, skip that one coffee. You've already got a free 10 minutes to read your Bible. Now just five, find another five minutes in your life. Okay, but you need every word of God to get through because it's the standard. And when you use it as a sample, oh, it's just one book that I use to get through life. You're going to be spiritually malnourished because you need every word of God. Now, the other problem when you don't rightly divide is when samples become the standard. When samples become the standard. So this is an example where a believer would listen to one preacher, let's say. They, they've got their favorite preacher and they listen to that preacher every day of their life or whatever. They listen, that, that's what, you know... All their understanding of the Word of God is on that one preacher. What, what does that mean? That means they've taken this sample and they've made it their standard in life. They've made that man their standard. Okay? Now the problem with that is it hinders the Holy Ghost from teaching you. It hinders the Holy Ghost from teaching you. Because in 1 John 2.27, 1 John 2.27, it says, But the anointing, speaking of the Holy Ghost, which ye have received of him, abideth in you, and ye need that, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. So who's supposed to teach you in this life? The, the, the anointing, the Holy Spirit that indwells you. That's your teacher. And yes, I'm not saying we shouldn't listen to preachers. Because the Holy Ghost can use that preacher to get some truth into you. But if all your mind is on that one preacher, that's your favorite preacher, you listen to that one person all the time, then you're in danger of setting a man as your standard rather than that the Word of God or God Himself, the Holy Spirit, that is to teach you all things. It is the Holy Ghost's role to teach you. And it will, you know, it's going to teach you God's wisdom. It said there in 1 John 2.27, And is truth and is no lie. When the Holy Ghost teaches you through the Word of God, it's the truth and there is no lie. The problem when a man teaches you is that, yeah, we try to use as much Bible as possible. We do the best to teach what we can. But there's always that, there's always that, ability, that opportunity because we have the flesh, because we have man's wisdom, to say something that is not quite accurate. Now, that's not my goal. It's not my goal, obviously, to teach something false. But I promise you, if you're, going to spend, if you're going to be a preacher and you're going to be preaching every week, there's going to come a time when you just say something wrong. And there's been time, I've been preaching for about, I don't know, five or six years on a monthly basis in my previous churches. I've gone back and listened to some of my old sermons, and I was like, oh man, that was bad. <laughs> and I, I wouldn't preach that anymore. I, I'd, I'd preach that differently because it just wasn't accurate. There were some mistakes in that, in that sermon. So at the time, it wasn't my intention. And at the time, I was trying to preach the word of God as truth. But every now and again, you know, you're going to, because you're man, you're going to, be, you're going to preach something that's not quite right. Okay, it's just going to happen. But if you've got the Holy Ghost as your standard, He's going to make sure it's 100% correct. 
Now, please turn to Acts 14. Acts 14, I'm wrapping up now. Acts 14, verse 8. Acts 14, verse 8. This is a really interesting story. And I think it's really applicable again to newer believers that hold man as a standard rather than the sample. Okay? Acts 14, Acts 14, verse 8. So obviously this is after Jesus Christ had resurrected and gone to be on the right hand side of the Father. And then we have, um, yeah, we have Paul here. So let's, let's pick it up in verse number 8. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, so he couldn't walk, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. So Paul was able to do this miracle. Okay? Now, why was he able to do this miracle? Because according, according, it says here that the man had the faith to be healed. The man was a believer. Okay? He was healed physically. And he was able to raise this man who, who couldn't walk, who was lame. And he was able to get up on his feet. He leaped up and walked in verse, in verse 10. And look at verse 11. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of uh, Laconia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. So when they looked at Paul, were they looking at a man? No, they had elevated him as a god. They started to worship him as a god. Paul, who's meant to be a sample, who's meant to be an example of Jesus Christ to the people in this city, had risen him to the standard, had risen him up to Godhood. Okay? And look at this, verse 12. And they called Barnabas, because Barnabas was his, was his helper at the time. They called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates and would have done sacrifice for the people. So not only are they saying they're gods and they're worshipping like gods and had set them as the, as the standard, now they want to worship and, and, and sacrifice animals at their feet. Look at verse 14. Which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people crying out and saying, Sirs, why do you these things? We also are men of like passions with you. And preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. Who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, Filling our hearts with food and gladness. Now, before I read verses 18 and 19, I just want to paint this picture to you, right? This city had seen and done a great work for God. They had healed this man who was lame. And they start worshipping him as God. They start sacrificing and, and giving of themselves to these, you know, gods. God men, if they don't want to call that. And this is, and I know this is, my, this is an extreme case, okay? But I do believe we can apply this to Christianity. When young believers, carnal Christians, lift up their pastor, lift up their favorite preacher, it's almost to the point of Godhood, and they want to worship them. Their whole life is centered around that one person. Okay? And it's like, whatever they say, that goes. That must be true. You know? And even, even when, when, when they fail, it's like, no, they're still right. <laughs> even when they do good, you know, when they do wrong, they're still right. Because they've transformed what was meant to be an example was meant to be a, a, a sample to the standard. This is very dangerous. And I see this happen time and time. I've seen this in my whole life. Time and time again. Someone praising a preacher beyond what they ought to be praised. Yeah, it's good to have your favorite preachers. I'm not saying that. It's good to honor and respect your pastor. That's good. But make sure you have Jesus Christ as the standard. 
Make sure even when you understand, when you realize they fail, you go, well, they're men. They're going to fail because they have like passions. They have difficulties in their life. They have uh, frailties in their life. But I know that Jesus Christ will never fail. And you have Jesus Christ as your God. And if you read the book of 1 Corinthians, you'll see that Paul likens that church because they had their favorite preachers. I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Apollos. They had their favorite preachers. And he says, hey, it's like you've put them in the place of Christ. You know, he says, was Paul crucified for you? You know, were you baptized in the name of Paul? No, they had set these men higher than they ought to. This is something that carnal Christians do all the time. You know? And here's the problem. When you're too enamored with one man, when you hold one man way too high in your heart, which that position ought to be God, when they fail, then the amount that you love them, the amount that you're enamored with them, the amount that you worship them, becomes the opposite. That same love now becomes, that, that, that measure of love becomes a measure, that same measure of hatred. That same measure of appreciation becomes the same measure of bitterness. Okay? Because they were unbalanced to begin with. Okay? Someone else that looked at that preacher and they've made a mistake that was balanced to be like, oh, that's, a, that's a shame. It's a shame they made a mistake. But they're not going to turn around and, and, and totally try to hate that person and be obsessed on that person on the, on the other side. Because they were able to maintain a balance. They had Jesus Christ as the standard and, and, and not man as the standard. Look at verse 18. Verse 18. And when these sayings scarce restrained they the people, that they had not done sacrifice unto them, and there came um, thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people... And having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. The same people who worshipped them like gods, right? When they realized that, oh, Paul doesn't meet, well, you know, that is not, is not what we wanted, and things have gone wrong. Now they stone him. They try to kill him. They hate him. The same measure that they loved now becomes that measure of hatred. And I've seen, again, it, it drives me crazy when I see this happen. And when I see one person so obsessed in hatred toward a preacher, in hatred toward a pastor, it just tells me that there was a time in their life that they loved that preacher way too much, they were so enamored and they worshipped that preacher way too much and had set that person in, in the place of God. That's what happens. So I want us to be mindful, I want us to be balanced. Yes, have your favourite preachers. Have men of God that you look up to, but don't elevate them to the level of God. Don't elevate them to the level of Jesus Christ, who is the standard. And the problem happens again when men fail. When men fail, when you, when you have this imbalance in your life, you're going to think, God has failed me. You're going to think, church has failed me. And you're going to get out of the Bible, you're going to stop reading, you're going to get out of church, because you see the hypocrisy of man, and yes, all, you know, all men are hypocrites to some extent, because we all have that frail flesh. And then you totally get off track because you were unbalanced. You didn't have, you didn't rightly def divide between the samples and the standard that God has left us. So I hope that's given you some things to think about. Um, let me just wrap up with a personal story. <clears throat> when, I, when I first um, uh, sort of got myself into a good church, my first IFB church, it was um, a church in Seven Hills. There was a great preacher, a great pastor. I got baptized by him. My wife did as well. We got married in that church, Christina and I. And uh, I learned a lot of great truths. Because in the watered down Baptist church, Water Baptist Union church I was going to, I wasn't really learning all that much. You know, you, you know, God is love pretty much every week. You know, I mean, of course God is love, but I don't need to hear it every week. You know, we want to hear other things too. So when I got into a good church, I was hearing good doctrine, good foundational things. And I didn't know at the time. But I had risen, that man had risen in my heart, probably in a bad place. You know, I, I looked up because I was learning such great truths, you know. And uh, I was really appreciative that I was learning all these great things. Uh, eventually we left the church for other reasons. Um, but then it came out <clears throat> that uh, he was a missionary. I won't, I won't give too much information away. But he was a missionary in a foreign land. And then he committed adultery against his wife. He committed adultery. And this was, honestly, this, this man of God, in my eyes, was amazing. He preached Sunday morning, Sunday school, and then Sunday service, 
Then he'd preach Sunday night. Then he had Wednesday night, he'd preach on Wednesday night. And then on Tuesday night, he had a Bible college course that he taught in the church. And I think, well, was that maybe that was Thursday night? Every second Sunday night after church service, he'd be on the community radio preaching, you know, on Christianity and, and answering questions and phone calls. And then he'd be soul winning every Saturday. And I think he was soul winning every Wednesday. And as like, and then he was preaching at the, he was teaching, he was lecturing at the Bible college. The main Bible college, IFB Bible college that's in, in Sydney, Sydney, I can't remember what it's called, Sydney, I can't remember, anyway. I'm saying to you, he was doing a lot. He had a lot on his plate. I was thinking, how can this one man do so many things? Obviously, God was using him in a great way, teaching great doctrine, okay? The church was about 300 people, one of the biggest churches in Sydney. Then he finds himself as a missionary, commits adultery. Okay, and I remember when I heard about it, I was like, have you, ever, have you ever gone for shock? Maybe you've had a car accident and you go for shock. I didn't have a car accident, but I went for shock. I was like, how can this man who I looked up to, who I love so much, fail so badly? And I was burdened in my heart. I was so sad in my heart. I felt like someone had punched a hole right through me. Like I just felt empty, right? And... Day after day, just thinking about it, can't believe it, I can't believe it, I can't believe it. One week passed. Can't believe it, can't believe it, can't believe it. Two weeks passed. And I'm thinking, why am I feeling like this? I got to a point, well, what's going on? Why am I so discouraged? Why am I so downcast? And I finally realized I must have been holding a man way too highly. You know, I've got to set my eyes back on the Lord Jesus Christ, who never changes. I need to set my eyes back on God, who never lets me down. Set my eyes back on God who is always with me. Because men are going to fail. Even the best men that you can think of, there's a possibility that they can fail because they have that flesh. So, church, please keep this in mind. There's going to be times that I fail you. I hope it's nothing big like that, like I said. But I hope you're able to understand, well, it's because of man. <laughs> you know, he's doing the best he can to serve the Lord, trying to be that example. But even when they fail, I always have my eyes on Jesus. That's what's going to keep me grounded. My eyes are on the Word of God. I'm doing and listening and doing the Word of God. And I'm going to set my life upon that strong foundation, which is the Word. I'm going to set my eyes on the standard and not purely on the samples. And follow the samples, follow the examples, as long as they are following Jesus Christ. Let's pray.